Thank you for attending Will, the, Will of the Voters, the Future of Adult Use Marijuana in Ohio. The event is hosted by the Drug Enforcement and Policy Center at The Ohio State University Moritz College of Law. Before we begin, we have just a few notes we'd like to share with you. First, we want to draw your attention to the Q&A function at the bottom of the Zoom window. The chat is disabled, but you may submit questions at any time. Please note, however, that there is limited time for, available for Q&A during the webinar. Second, automatic closed captioning has been enabled for this event. To change how you view the, the transcription or to hide it, click Show Caption in the menu at the bottom of your Zoom window. Finally, this event is being recorded. The recording will be made available on our YouTube channel as soon as possible after the event. A link will be shared with all registrants via email. Follow us at OSU Law DEPC to stay up to date on our research, programming, and future events. Thank you again for joining us, and we hope you enjoy the discussion. Doug? Thank you so much, Holly, and thanks to you and Yana Hernova for helping us to organize uh, this conversation that we're having today on the will of the voters, the future of adult use marijuana here in the great state of Ohio. As I'm sure uh, many attending know, uh, a number of states have legalized uh, adult use marijuana, and Ohio has a vote on that. Actually, early voting has started already, but the uh, election day is two weeks away, and so the, we thought this was a particularly good time to talk specifically about one of the unique features of Ohio's consideration of the legalization of adult use marijuana reform through ballot initiative. Specifically, our, the proposal coming to voters this year is not a constitutional amendment, but just an initiated statute. And what that necessarily means is that it's gonna be treated like any other statute if it passes and the Ohio General Assembly will have the ability uh, and the authority to revise or even potentially uh, repeal uh, what transpires by the will of the voters. And we're here to sort of talk about uh, whether something like that's possible or likely to happen uh, politically, as well as to sort of get some advice from some outside experts who study these issues across the country uh, to suggest what the General Assembly they think ought to be doing uh, in response to a potential yes vote on uh, marijuana reform. And so let me uh, briefly introduce our four experts. We have two, I'm sort of considering insiders and two outsiders, though everybody is uh, uh, inside my heart for agreeing to spend their time talking about this important issue at, at, this, at this exciting time. Uh, and I'll go in the order that I plan to have them make some introductory remarks, uh, and then we will shift to some Q&A. Uh, as Holly mentioned, you can use the Q&A feature. I'll try to keep an eye on that to have some general questions to ask in addition to some I've prepared for the panelists. Okay, about the panelists, we're gonna start with uh, John Carney. He's a partner at Porter and Wright in the government relations team there. He also is a former member of the Ohio General Assembly uh, and so has that experience to draw on as well in talking about these issues. Uh, then we actually have a current member, Representative Josh Williams, who represents Ohio District 41. Uh, then we will hear from Jason Ortiz, uh, who's the Director of Strategic Initiatives at the Last Prisoner Project. And, and then we'll wrap up with Lynn Silver, who's the program director at the Public Health Institute. I could and would uh, talk about them for an extended period of time because they have a lot um, we could describe that shows their expertise on this subject matter, but I encourage each of them to talk a little bit about their own uh, background or perspective on these issues in their opening statements, uh, and then we'll have a chance to, to hear from them all and then have some Q&A. So uh, without further ado and, and doing that quickly so we have ample time for the discussion, uh, John, why don't you you lead us off with your perspective on you know what you predict is going to happen both at the ballot box and then in the gen general assembly thereafter. Thanks, Doug. Appreciate it. Uh, you know, as Doug indicates, I'm a partner here at Porter Wright. I represent uh, dispensaries, processors, cultivators uh, in the marketplace. In addition to being a healthcare corporate attorney here, um, I, I think the initiative is going to, going to pass. Um, you know, I think the the recent polling that shows it's up 58 percent. I'm I'm not convinced it's going to pass with 58 percent of the vote in the state. Um, but I, I do think it is going to pass. And um, I think for a number of reasons, one, I think it's crafted better this time. Um, I think as you've had a 
uh, recreational uh, marijuana program in the state. Uh, there's more and more money to interest that want to see it passed. I mean, you may be aware that there's only 160,000 Ohioans who have a medical use card. Um, that That's not enough to sustain the industry. And so I think the industry is very interested in seeing this pass. Um, and for those of you who understand the industry, you know, you've got a lot of uh, investors from outside of Ohio who have great interest in it passing in a state that has over 11 million people. Um, I also think you lack a uh, organized opposition, um, even though Senator Romachuk and Jane Timken are co-chairing the vote no on issue two campaign. There's not really any financial resources thus far that we've seen brought to bear that the children's hospitals in the state, their advocates are opposed to it. Uh, but again, for those of you who are political watchers out there, uh, we understand that political speech costs a lot of money. And in a state like Ohio, um, you know, in order to run an effective campaign to get something across the finish line, probably $20 million at least is what you need in order to be on air in Cleveland, Cincinnati, Columbus, Dayton, et cetera. And, you know, the no side just doesn't have those resources. So at the end of the day, I think it passes. I think the percentage by which it passes uh, will impact what the Ohio General Assembly wants to do with respect to making changes. Uh, the president of the Senate, Matt Huffman, has already made some comments with respect to how the 10 percent uh, of funds that will be, you know, essentially state resources to spend that he may have a different idea of how those dollars should be spent. I think the General Assembly might have some interest in uh, maybe using those dollars in a different way than the initiative requires them to be used. But I think if it passes, I would be very surprised to see the Ohio General Assembly reverse it and say we're not going to have recreational adult use uh, marijuana in Ohio. I think for a lot of the members of the General Assembly, they don't want to touch marijuana with the 10 foot pole, whether that's making it legal or making it illegal. I think they just want to stay away from it for a lot of those individuals, at least that I've had conversations with. Uh, so that's my initial thought, uh, Doug, and, and I'll open, you know, pass it back to you to pass it on to the next individual. Thank you so much. Very helpful. Very much uh, giving your perspective somewhat inside. And uh, now we'll go to Representative Williams, who actually is inside and get his take on both what he thinks the voters are going to do and then what he thinks is he and his colleagues are going to respond to thereafter. Uh, so unfortunately, I believe issue two is going to pass. Uh, I, I believe it's going to pass because it is a statutory initiative instead of being a constitutional provision, uh, leaving, leaving you know the legislature with the, the authority to override it entirely or, or, or modify it. And I believe it, it does need to be modified substantially. Um, so I, I know discussions have already started inside of um, the House of Representatives where I, I reside as the Vice Chair of Criminal Justice uh, in regards to whether it passes or, or fails, you know, what type of actions the legislature will take. Uh, I know there's interest in cleaning up uh, where tax resources will be allocated towards the collateral damages that issue two can pose, um, such as, you know, we currently have statutes on the book uh, as it relates to the use of drugs of abuse and whether or not you automatically lose your Second Amendment rights uh, moving forward. That, those are things that are collateral that, that many people don't pay attention to. Uh, one of the main concerns that I have is uh, growing inside of the home. Apparently for medical marijuana use in the state of Ohio, you can't grow inside your own home. And this initiative tries to push that forward, uh, exposing uh, minors uh, more frequently to the, the, the ability to, to uh, get their hands on uh, marijuana. And the thing that I like about the medical marijuana structure we currently have is that, you know, if you are in possession of medical marijuana, it has to be in its original packaging. So uh, my concern is we won't know what the source of uh, this recreational marijuana is. Will it flood in from other states? Will it be uh, normal marijuana that was on the streets before? Will it actually be produced um, by cultivators and, and dispensed in a dispensary? So I believe it is going to pass. I believe there's going to be substantial uh, regulatory changes and statutory changes that will come out of the House and out of the Senate, um, guiding us in the right way and providing the type of structure that we need uh, if we decide in the state of Ohio to go towards recreational marijuana, which I think the voters are going to uh, push that forward. And, and if I get to do a very quick uh, follow up, though, but it sounds like you don't expect a, a blanket repeal that you don't you haven't seen conversations to talk about completely wiping away the entire the entire initiative if it were to pass. Right. I, I believe we have respect for the voters' voices here in the state of Ohio. 
uh, whether we believe that is ill-advised or not is a different subject. Um, but I believe if it passes, we will look to try to provide a regulatory scheme, a, a statutory scheme that comports with the, the, the rest of our criminal justice system and taxation system here in the state of Ohio uh, to make it a workable solution, a, a, a sort of compromise. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Now we'll turn to Jason Ortiz from the Mass Prisoner Project. I know you've done a lot of work and your organization has done a lot of work following up other states as they've enacted uh, adult use systems. So can you talk about that background and your own sense of, of what Ohio might look to do to implement the law were it to pass? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you again to the Ohio State Drug Enforcement Policy Center for having me. My name is Jason Ortiz. I'm the Director of Strategic Initiatives at the Last Prisoner Project. Here at LPP, we help make sure we actually address the unjust and racist nature of the war on drugs by making sure that we're not leaving behind those who are currently incarcerated for cannabis as we start to talk about legal cannabis sales. And on a personal level, I was one of those folks who was arrested as a young person for cannabis possession and thrown out of school, thrown into the criminal justice system. And so I know full well the impacts of criminalization on youth and how that can destroy somebody's life can rip them from their support structures and make it very difficult to be a constructive member of society. And so we're very excited that Ohio is moving forward and that there's actual progress on this. Out of the other 24 states that have passed legalization, there has not been a repeal. So as this uh, initiative does pass, which it does seem like it is likely to pass, and partly because this is a bipartisan supported issue when it comes to the voters. Even within the state of Ohio, there is a majority support from Republicans to make sure that this passes. And a lot to do with some of the concerns earlier around freedom, being able to consume and grow cannabis in your own house, and making sure we're not adding any more folks to the criminal justice system moving forward. So I do think this is going to pass. Uh, what the legislature will likely do is have to gr grapple with all the specific details that come with undoing 40, 50 years of uh, selective enforcement and making sure that there is a focus on criminal justice reform, reentry support, making sure that the funding that is going to come in from the taxation does go to heal those communities. And that's a very complicated thing. And so making sure that, yes, we are protecting our young folks from making sure that they don't have you know, inappropriate access, but also reminding everyone that we are talking about a plant. And having a plant in your home is not a threat to anyone. We can talk about the details of what it's like to make sure that it's a secure place, but home grow will likely be a big point of contention as the legislature decides on all the details. But I think where it's our responsibility is to make sure that the legislature does not lose sight of criminal justice reforms. Right now, this initiative will not actually automatically introduce automatic expungement or automatic resentencing, but the legislature does have the opportunity to focus on that and making sure that that's what we do moving forward. Uh, I think what will end up happening is there will be lots of changes to the law, lots of different uh, special interests and community groups will be able to say what it is exactly that they want. And it's really up to the legislature and the people to hold some listening sessions and really get to the nuts and bolts of where people are confused, do some public education, find out what works in other states. And in places like Missouri and Michigan, there's already been plenty of uh, examples and evidence to work from of what could work and how Ohio could do it specifically. So I think this is a huge opportunity to really look at what is currently happening how we want to address it for our communities and make sure that we don't forget that there are still people incarcerated for a crime that we are about to legalize. And we should make sure that we make sure all of those folks are home with their families as we be debate the nuances of sales. Thank you, Jason. You mentioned it sort of towards the end, uh, Missouri and Michigan as, as states that, I don't know if you were suggesting those are particularly good models or they're just the sort of Midwestern neighbors. And so they're the ones to look at, but um, yeah, maybe we can get to this a little bit more later in the discussion, but are there particular states that, from the criminal justice perspective that you think is, have done a particularly good job of addressing the issues that, that you highlighted? Uh, you know, I, it's always inevitable that the Ohio General Assembly will look elsewhere, whether they follow elsewhere remains to be seen. But if you were to encourage them to take a particular look at, at a particular state that you think has done a particularly good job uh, of following up on some of these criminal justice fronts, what states come to mind? Yeah, I mean, there's a number of states you can pull different pieces from that's 100% available to everyone, right? There's roughly 10 different states that have resentencing provisions. I mean, Missouri did have, including automatic sentence modification, and so that is a good one to go to. Michigan just has a lot more history and a lot more years to look at in the efforts that they did. But states like California also included automatic expungement, and there are lots of examples of how to do this. And so definitely looking at your neighbors makes sense first. If we're looking for gold standards, definitely looking at places like California and uh, other states that have already done this will be really helpful. Thank you very much, Jason. And a nice bridge to, to Lynn, since I think you're in California, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, you can draw on some of those experiences, though, though I suspect talking 
some more public health issues as you, you know, talk through what Ohio is facing and what might follow. Thank you so much, Doug, and it's a pleasure to be here with um, all of you from Ohio this morning. Um, I will take a few minutes to talk about the health effects because I think that's the part of the piece that, that gets lost. So my name's uh, Lynn Silver. I'm a pediatrician um, and I'm direct, a senior advisor at the Public Health Institute and a professor at the University of California, San Francisco. Um, I'm not a pollster or an expert on Ohio politics, so I'll focus on what I think they ought to do and why. Um, I'm coming at this problem as a pediatrician, a public health professional who's worked on regulating many products, um, and an epidemiologist who's been studying the cannabis industry for the past seven years. But I also come at it as a mother and stepmom of five, and lastly, as someone whose first love developed psychosis and schizophrenia. So I really care about preventing mental illness and mental health effects of cannabis. Why do I mention this? The product Ohio is deciding how to treat is not the botanical plant from Professor Berman's or my college days. That joint that your mama rolled had about three to 5% THC. It got you high, but only rarely did it make people seriously ill. Over the last 20 years, the US cannabis market has become something completely different. Flour is five to 10 times stronger at 20 to 35% THC and a vast array of manufactured and edible and so-called hemp products um, that are flashily packaged has emerged. And many of these are 80 or 90 or almost 100% THC. Some of them imitate products like McFlurries, Cocoa Pebbles and Skittles. Um, they are to cannabis what strawberry Pop-Tarts are to strawberries or Coca-Cola is to a beet plant. Um, I call it the coca colization of cannabis. While most people can still get high uh, without ill effects and many enjoy that, a growing minority are not getting off so easily. And between one in 10 of, uh, one to two of every 10 users are developing dependency. Uh, vaping cannabis by 12th graders tripled just since 2017, often at school, disrupting education. Some schools are not letting kids go to the bathroom because of vaping. Daily use in young adults has tripled and that means that today, one in 10, 19 to 30 year olds is walking around high almost every day and a whole lot of high school students. That's not good for learning or for productivity. Ask any school principal what they're seeing. Daily use of cannabis above 10% THC, which is practically our entire market now, is associated with a five-fold increase in the risk of psychosis and schizophrenia, a problem we all know we're failing as a society to manage and we now estimate that about 12 to 30% of new onset psychosis cases may be triggered by cannabis, particularly the high potency concentrates. Some of this can be reversed, others are irreversible breaks. We also now know that cannabis increases suicidality, mood disorders, car accidents, and probably heart attacks. Although many consumers take it believing uh, industry messaging that it's a safe stress reliever. Poisonings of young children are up 1400%, and cannabis ER visits in California by seniors rose 1800%. Lastly, in terms of health effects, as a pediatrician, my greatest concern is use during pregnancy, where it's causing low birth weight, um, as well as long-term uh, neurological harms to children who are exposed in utero, according to major new NIH studies. And that's a bell that kids can't unring, uh, yet cannabis use in pregnancy has nearly doubled in California. So what do I think Ohio legislators ought to do given that context? First, I totally agree with Jason, um, but I think you can separate out the criminal injustice issues of longstanding discriminatory arrests and incarceration and take care of those. You don't need to create a giant for-profit industry to fix those. Fully decriminalize small-scale possession and create and fund automatic expungement of criminal records from the war on drugs. Um, this was conspicuously absent from issue two and that needs to be fixed. California has now expunged 87% of eligible convictions with huge benefits for people. Do that today, no matter what you do about issue two. Also, you need to change the penalties for minors in issue two to not criminalize under age possession, but to seek other remedies that don't channel kids into the criminal justice system give them criminal records, or create civil debt traps from fines, which is equally problematic. Um, I personally think allowing adults to grow a few plants is fine. Um, 
For me, the real danger to the health of Ohioans comes from building a powerhouse of agricultural and industrial interests that profit from a harmful and addictive drug, from building a new tobacco industry. Cannabis is no ordinary commodity. Like tobacco, you don't want it or hemp to be the growth engine of the Ohio economy because whatever revenue and jobs it generates will be heavily offset by healthcare and social expenditures, um, by people with additional cases of mental illness, babies affected by exposure, car accidents, and so forth. Um, this burden will not be equitably distributed. In fact, one of the most cynical and infuriating provisions of issue two is where it pretends to cap potency, but actually shields the highest potency products from regulation. So I, I would say either don't legalize and live with the ambiguity of decriminalization as the Dutch do, which is okay. But if you do legalize commercial sales, do it with a totally different approach. One that says we will allow legal sale, but only in a very careful system whose specified goal is to provide legal access more safely but without driving up consumption. One that seeks expressly to avoid creating a new big tobacco. The best example I've seen of that, of safer legalization is in Quebec, which piggybacked on its existing alcohol monopoly to create a state-owned cannabis monopoly. It operates attractive stores and provides online access and collects revenue, but it doesn't advertise and it uh, extensively restricts the types of products uh, sold. Uh, so they're not selling more dangerous high potency concentrates, flavored vapes like jewels or products that are obviously going to attract kids. We can do this in the United States um, publicly or contracting with a nonprofit. Um, profits from this system can be channeled back to support substance use prevention, et cetera, and hiring can be equity focused. Whether the state adopts a monopoly or a for-profit system, taxes should be higher, 20 to 40% and tiered to THC content. The proposed 10% is way too low to fund what is promised and much lower than in other states. Washington, for example, is 37%. Contrary to what industry says, low taxes have not solved the illicit market. Conflicts of interest need to be strongly prohibited. I don't know if you saw what happened in Minnesota where the proposed director of the regulatory agency was a non-compliant um, you know, businesswoman um, who was not a good example. Uh, scientific advisory boards without conflicts should be created and the regulatory bodies should focus to start by only allowing a restricted lower risk and lower potency range of products. That's even more important than lab testing. We don't need 90% TH shatter or dabbing or wax pens. Regulation should be integrated with hemp regulation to make sure that intoxicating hemp products are not being sold. Plain packaging should be required and health warnings similar to those the FDA is adopting for tobacco products. People have been taken in by industry palaver and the awareness of the health risks is dismally low and inaccurate. So it's very important that we have strong, robust health warnings um, and advertising should be restricted to the maximal extent possible. We don't need cookies, sweatshirts running around our schools. Um, we also recommend preserving uh, local control and not allowing unlimited production because the biggest driver we've seen of the illicit market in other states is just too much production um, so that you have uh, uh, an excessive mask of cannabis being produced and looking for warm bodies to consume it. And that's driving um, both aggressive advertising and, um, and illicit marketing. Um, so as we speak, to wrap up, I know I've gone on a bit, as we speak, the cannabis industry lobbyists are likely inundating the halls of the General Assembly. They are probably making campaign donations, just as the tobacco industry did. So those who care about kids and public health need to be as organized and as vocal as the industry. You need to show up, speak out, be present, bring teachers and parents and doctors and students and school nurses and lawyers to talk about what is happening and what's being seen around the country. Um, if you're concerned about the health of the community and health equity, you should reject issue two's approach and start fresh. We're still learning about what the best way to do this is, but you can learn from our mistakes in California, for example. Be cautious, be deliberate, take profit out of it, fix criminal just injustice no matter what. But if Ohio does legalize commercial activity, flip the script, 
and base everything on providing legal access through a system that will not drive up consumption and will protect our kids. Thank you. Thank you, Lynn. And, you know, I think notable that you mentioned Quebec. Uh, that's obviously not a state here in the U.S. And one of the concerns I have, or at least would be eager to have other, uh, maybe of our, our, our Ohio insiders speak to is the public health community, I think, has been talking for quite some time in a number of states about uh, a variety of the kinds of reforms that, that Lynn was talking about to try to minimize the risk of commercialization and, and um, you know, excessive production and excessive use or irresponsible use, you might say, in a variety of settings. <clears throat> but it doesn't seem like many states have, have gone that path or have sought to, you know, create as many of the regulations that Lynn was talking about. Do you have a sense of, you know, would that be more politically viable in a state that at least the insiders, and speaking now about the Ohio General Assembly, seems resistant to reform so that maybe they'd be eager to to try to build a, whether it's a nonprofit system or not, although I tend to also think our General Assembly tends to be not so keen on regulation and, and big government. And so I'm just curious, you're smiling, John, so I'll, uh, I'll pick on you first, but then I'll go to Representative Williams about just, you know, is is in some respects, you know, at least public health best practices, as, as Lynn was suggesting, maybe just a political non-starter because of other factors that are sort of baked into our system? Uh, you know, I, I think members of the General Assembly are clearly interested in the public health of Ohioans. Um, you know, and, and this is an Ohio specific question, but our political system in the United States has come to revolve around campaign contributions and, you know, support uh, really does depend on do you have the financial wherewithal to support the initiative you're after? And, uh, you know, unfortunately, the Ohio General Assembly, uh, you know, you look at it and you look at House Bill 6 and the influence that the energy industry was able to buy in the Ohio General Assembly. And, you know, I, I think, unfortunately, the resources are going to be stacked on the side of the industry that is is generating profit off of this. And, and I appreciate uh, Dr. Silver's comments about we need to be focused on what can we do to make sure that there isn't an oversupply and that, you know, children aren't affected by this. And I absolutely think that's right. And I think the members of the General Assembly, as, as Rep. Williams, I think, will speak to, are going to be absolutely concerned about that. But at the end of the day, this this is a business and the folks who are making money are going to buy political influence because they're going to have the resources to do so. And while, you know, on the one hand, we're saying, well, we want to make sure that people aren't harmed by it. You know, as I said at the outset, there's only 160,000 medical use cards that have been distributed in Ohio. The amount of money that it takes just to open up a dispensary is well over a million dollars in Ohio. And so a lot of money has been expended to open up these businesses that are struggling right now in Ohio. And inevitably, you've got whether it's shareholders or they're closely held businesses where people have put their own where, you know, wealth into it, they need to get that money back out of it from their perspective. And so you've got these competing factors where you're saying, well, we need to worry about the public health and we've got to take care of children. And I think all your operators would say that, too. We do not want our purchasers of, uh, you know, marijuana when it's a edible gummy that looks like a candy that a kid could get a hold of and think this is just a candy to end up eating this and end up in the ED. They, they don't want that to happen. And so I think there's going to be interest by the industry to say, what do we do to make sure that this isn't ending up in the hands of a young person, just like the alcohol industry. I mean, I don't think the alcohol industry wants 15 year olds to be drinking their product and getting sick and ending up in the emergency department. So there will be that interest, but the financial drive to make this industry work at the end of the day is going to result with these folks at the General Assembly making contributions saying, you can't tie our hands because otherwise our business isn't going to be able to work. And if our business doesn't work, we can't pay the tax dollars, et cetera. And so it's going to be that push pull. Um, and I'd be interested to hear what Representative Williams has to say about it, because, you know, it's been a while since I've been a member of the General Assembly and he has a better sense of, of who's a member today. But I'm guessing that that push pull is going to go on within the House and within the Senate. Go ahead, Representative Williams. Uh, yeah, I, I believe John is absolutely correct. I mean, there's this push-pull between public safety and, and creating a good regulatory scheme here in the state of Ohio. Um, of course, there's going to be concerns about access to children, especially with the use of, of edibles um, and, and the idea that if we don't properly regulate it, we could see bad actors come into the industries, 
uh, with simulated edibles with other other products in it, such as fentanyl. Um, and, and we've had a spur of that before uh, here in Lucas County. So there's definitely a public health concern. We've seen in other states that uh, allow for recreational marijuana increase in OVI charges for marijuana use. Uh, individuals believing that since marijuana is now legal, that it will be uh, legal to drive uh, behind the wheel using that. We've also we've also seen the use of drug traffickers um, using uh, marijuana uh, legalization as a way of of uh, camouflaging their their uh, their drug trafficking. We saw that come out of Connecticut uh, on a case where uh, essentially medical marijuana allowed for the burning of marijuana, and it threw out a case where an individual was transporting uh, cocaine. And uh, the dog alerted to the smell of burnt marijuana, and therefore that state ruled that there was no probable cause now for the smell of burnt marijuana. I saw this initiative included the, the still prohibition against burning inside of the car, but there's still concerns from a criminal justice perspective. I mean, I'm a criminal defense attorney, um, and I, I teach criminal law and criminal procedure at Adrian College, and I could easily see a drug trafficker going through the state of Ohio and merely adding mar a, a small amount of marijuana to his vehicle. And uh, if a dog alerts and it wasn't properly trained after the enactment of this statute, um, one could argue that that now is not probable cause to search the vehicle and the entire conviction can be thrown out. Um, so those are some of the, the criminal justice concerns we have when it comes to enforcement. When it comes to public safety, of course, the uh, the amount of THC and, and uh, uh, these type of products compared to medical marijuana, uh, in, including edibles and its readiness and availableness uh, to consumers. So my, one of my main concerns is, is the homegrown. Uh, once you open the door to homegrown marijuana inside of the home, you lose the ability to regulate it because then uh, there's no packaging requirement uh, that, that speaks as to the THC levels and where it was purchased. So what we've been seeing here in the criminal justice space is individuals with an Ohio medical marijuana license getting caught and charged with trafficking in marijuana because they would bring large amounts of marijuana back across the border from Michigan. And they will be caught with those products still in the packaging that indicates that it came from Michigan. So how can we create a recreational industry here in the state of Ohio that's sustainable, where taxes are generated and used for public good, if we also have a subcategory of marijuana that's unregulated, um, that you don't know where the source is, you don't know if any taxes were collected on its distribution and sale. Uh, so it, it literally would create a Wild West style system here, like we've seen in some of the other um, states that allow for homegrown, where individuals would then uh, uh, create co-ops, uh, where, yeah, there was a six plant mac maximum per individual, but no maximum per household, uh, there you would create co-ops and big, large grow operations that were outside the cultivation uh, regulations that would be pressed onto industry. So if you truly want to bring investment from outside the state and within the state into a, a industry uh, through recreational marijuana, you have to create a regulatory scheme, a statutory scheme that will provide, one, the actual benefits that we would see through recreational marijuana with increased taxes that can be used in other areas. But you also have to provide regulations so bad actors can't enter in uh, to our system and flood um, our state with unregulated marijuana. Thank you very much. I want to get back in a minute, Lynn. So just to warn you, we're going to talk about home grow and potency limits in a second. But I want to turn to, to Jason first and maybe sort of frame it this way, especially because obviously there are so many issues uh, that issue two's passage would necessarily implicate so many uh, dimensions of what the General Assembly might need to do or want to do as follow up. <clears throat> I'd love to get from you, especially hearing some of the criminal justice concerns that I think are, are kind of rightly on both sides, right? We wanna make sure that we do the remediation of people with past convictions and improve lives that way, but we also don't wanna have a legalized regime be kind of a, a criminal justice license for people not to follow the rules and regulations that are being put in place. <clears throat> do you have a sense, um, you know, kind of top two, top three sort of reforms that you think are most important to get the General Assembly to focus on sort of first and foremost, both kind of considering some of the political challenges that we've been talking about, you know, what's just doable or what you've seen across the country seems most doable, and then also that has the most impact. And that's my hint to you, Lynn, as well, whether, you know, you think potency limits or, or home grow are the ones that should be the focal point. You know, my sense is the General Assembly is certainly going to care about this, but uh, they're at risk of getting flooded with, you know, a range of different proposals, have lots of different advocates uh, pushing lots of different particulars, and whether you, from a national perspective, have a sense of, you know, here's really what is so important to get done first. You rightly noted that issue two 
doesn't directly address, doesn't have any operational components for criminal justice reform. And so kind of what, what should be top on the to-do list? Yeah, definitely. So first, I just want to acknowledge that cannabis prohibition has failed as a policy. And the reason we're having this debate is because the way we've been doing it so far has not improved public safety, but regulation of cannabis has seen, according to the CDC, a drop in youth use in every state that has legalized cannabis. So all of the issues that have been brought up are made easier to manage under a regulatory system than under prohibition. So we should, no matter the concerns, still encourage the passage of this legislation, of this ballot measure, so that we can get to the point of actually having a rational and reasonable conversation about regulations. For us, of course, retroactive relief, state-initiated expungement and relief procedures are absolutely the number one thing we should talk about. And I'm very empowered and excited to hear that Lynn also agrees that we should start with that. And so there's clearly bipartisan and you know across the sector support for really putting equity and justice first. And where I do think we will agree is in the sequencing of how we're gonna do things. While we should absolutely pass this initiative so that we can get to that point, how and when different parts of the process get initiated, get implemented, started is going to be very important for the success of this program. I agree that we should focus on making sure that our regulatory system creates a safe regulatory environment, that we're making sure that all those that were impacted negatively have the ability to address those negative impacts, and also that we're taking the community input into account and in what exactly is the most uh, necessary changes or necessary pieces to keep into that policy. When it comes to home growth, Home grow is overwhelmingly supported by both sides of the aisle as an ability for folks to engage and learn about the plant in the safety and comfort of their own home and understand what it would do for them and how they might be able to use it to help improve their lives. The reality is, again, it's a plant. If a young person were to touch a live plant, they would not suffer any negative consequences whatsoever. It is something that we should be treating as an educational problem that we need to teach folks how to interact with the plant in a safe way. Now, as we move forward into regulation and making sure we're figuring out how to manage the industry, again, there are lots of states that we can look to. You know, I was the uh, previous president of the Minority Cannabis Business Association when we studied equity policies very exclusively. And in all the different states, we were not able to make sure that the equity policies would be put first. And I think the sequencing of making sure that we're going justice first, equity second, business and profit third, gives us enough time to address all the concerns that Lynn brought up, gives us time to bring in experts from around the country to actually talk about what worked well in different states. And by extending out that timeline a bit, we can make sure we're not rushing to any judgment. So I do think we can take it slow, but we won't be able to get to the point of taking it slow until we pass this initiative. That being said, it's clear that everyone on this panel is focused on the interest of justice. And so if we can make sure that retroactive relief, resentencing, sentence modification, all of the different formats of criminal justice that can be reformed and start with that, and then making sure that our kids are safe second, I think we'll end up in a good place and the legislature can create a system that really shows the rest of the country how to put equity and safety first. Thank you, Jason, appreciate that. And Linda, I'm turning back to you as I, as I sort of forewarned, you know, was, I found it very interesting that you didn't express the same concerns about home growth that we heard from, from Representative Williams. I noticed in the comments, uh, there was reference to Maryland, which allows for two plants. You know, it's always very interesting to, to wonder how you can find the Goldilocks on a lot of these fronts. Same is certainly true, I think, with potency limits. Um, that there's already been some talk, I think, and some confusion over the way the initiative uh, provides for uh, a possible potency ceiling or floor or whatever, however you might want to describe it. The key being, I sense there's growing interest in more potency regulation for public health reasons. Is that your top priority? Is that what you see as the most important thing? If there's only a couple things that you would have time to talk to the General Assembly about that you think are the, the biggest and most important public health focal points, given that when you spoke, you mentioned lots of things that, you know, some may be real possible, but some some seem quite unlikely, especially if issue two passes. And so just for your thoughts about what are, what are the what are the top items um, that you think have the, the greatest public health impact that you, you would encourage, whether it's advocates or the General Assembly, to focus on first? Actually, before I get to potency, I just want to say I will never accept a legislature that runs on campaign donations from harmful industries. Um, it took us a long time. It took us a long time for it not to be acceptable for a legislator to take money from the tobacco industry, but today most legislators will not take money from the tobacco industry. And I think we need to get to the same place with the cannabis industry um, as people gain an understanding that whether or not you think it should be legalized to reduce criminal injustice, which has very strong arguments, um, 
you it's still a harmful product to many people. It's not a medicine. It's not a safe wellness product. So I strongly discourage that. But getting back to home grows, um, it's not my top priority issue. But I will say the drivers of the illicit market in California and other states are not the four plants in someone's house. They're giant outdoor grows, you know, being done clandestinely, stealing water, using harmful pesticides on a large scale. Those are the, the real problems we're seeing with the illicit market. Um, potency. I think potency is one of the most challenging and important issues that needs to be addressed. The massive increase both in the potency of flour um, and this huge mass commercialization of industrialized chemical products that have been derived from cannabis but are not the botanical plant and look very little like the botanical plant and don't affect the human body the same way is very important. With all the research we did with interviews um, all across the country from people from uh, many different sectors as part of our qualitative research, this was acknowledged as the most dangerous trend in the industry responsible for increasing addiction and severe adverse effects. The NIH, the Surgeon General, the US Senate have all identified this. Where there's a lot of uncertainty is what do you do about it? I'm on a group working on this in California right now. Do you do a hard limit and say you can't sell anything over 50% or 40% as some states have done? Um, do you limit the number of milligrams in a package as Canada has done, for example? Do you tax by potency as New York and Illinois have chosen to do? Um, what you can't do is what California has done, which is nothing. Uh, so our market is now a nightmare of high potency products. Maryland allows sale of vapes, but not other concentrates, for example, in its recreational market. Um, do you, one simple option is just requiring retailers to sell lower potency products, which you can't even get in California now. Um, so I personally vote for all of the above. I think we have to start cautiously because what I do know from California and other states is once a product gets into the market, it's almost impossible to get it off. Um, you can start with a more limited array of legal products and bring together scientists and experts to come up with a longer term proposal. But if you start with an anything goes as issue two would guarantee, um, it will be extremely difficult to pull back. In California, which was working for years to ban flavored tobacco and just successfully did it, at the very same time they were doing that, they were legalizing flavored cannabis products that look just like grape flavored Juul. And now we're trying to get those off the market and the industry is blocking it. Um, it's, they did that successfully just a few months ago. The industry will fight tooth and nail against all the provisions to make the market safer, including even the most obvious things about products that are attractive to children. That has been my experience. They have not been ethical partners in trying to protect children. It will be up to the state of Ohio to protect children. Uh, have no illusions, the types of products that will hit your market if you don't take strong regulatory action to protect children. Uh, we have seen that. So I would say plain packaging, potency <laughs> limits, and not having a for-profit industry are my top three. Thank you. I appreciate that. I think Representative Williams, do you have your hand up? Did you want to respond or speak to these yeah. issues? Well, very briefly, I want to speak in regards to some of Jason's concerns and main priorities in regards to criminal justice reform. You know, issue two doesn't need to pass in order to get those criminal justice reforms. If it does, it definitely needs to be a priority. And we've already done that in the legislature. So I will point towards House Bill 67, uh, which I introduced with my joint sponsor, Bill Sykes, which is a retroactive sentencing bill. We already envision that if issue two uh, passes, you know, it is only equitable to allow individuals to be resentenced and have their sentences modified if the penalty has been reduced or eliminated. We looked at the same thing when it came to the use of uh, constitutional carry passing and uh, prior concealed carry related offenses here in the state of Ohio. So there is some push and momentum in the state legislature when it comes to uh, criminal justice reform, retroactive sentencing. And uh, there's even another bill that will come out of my office in mid November that deals with uh, gun violence that has a, uh, a, a automatic ceiling mechanism for uh, F4, F5s, nonviolent felonies um, to give an automatic ceiling uh, provision, uh, not expungement, but ceiling um, and, and so there is momentum for that type of criminal justice reform here in the state of Ohio, and I'm proud to be a champion for that stuff, even without issue two passing uh, or, or with before it even uh, was eligible to be on the ballot. 
uh, we were looking at doing some of these criminal justice reforms. And I'm proud to say that there is uh, a wide range of bipartisan support in, in the House for for uh, for reforms like that that are reasonable in the criminal justice space. I just wanted to point that out before we move on to another topic. Uh, I, re I really appreciate that. And thank you for the work that you're doing in that respect. I'm going to turn to John in a minute, though. Representative Williams, you're going to be part of this question in kind of an insider way. But then I, I also want our outsiders to be thinking about kind of answers writ large. And that has to do with sort of the players that will end up taking a particularly significant role as we focus on rollout or or the development of regulations and, and possible future legislation. Uh, one that I saw in the comments that was mentioned is our governor, Governor DeWine. Obviously, a governor has an important uh, bully pulpit on top of uh, having to sign off on any legislation. My understanding is is he's a pretty vocal opponent uh, of issue two, and yet we haven't seen him cutting commercials quite to the same degree that he has on issue one. And and so the degree of, of opposition uh, hasn't been as vocal as it has been for some some prior initiatives and, and some of the other priorities that he has. Similarly, uh, I believe the Senate president, Matt Huffman, has come out pretty vocally against issue two as well. Uh, important role for sure. I don't think the Speaker of the House, the, the uh, Stevens, has, has had similar comments, but presumably the leaders in the General Assembly are important. I want to throw two more on there. And John, I'll start with you because I think you also have experience working under our current uh, regulatory regime. You know, there's also, of course, the division of cannabis control that will be sort of created, as I understand it, in the Department of Commerce to be in charge of implementing whatever regulations are in place there. That always seems like something that's very important. Uh, you know, who's who's part of the administrative structure? Uh, but whether you have a sense of, you know, is that a lot more important than than some of these legislative leaders? And then I think one factor that we haven't focused on at all, uh, I haven't seen it much discussed, but that other states I've certainly seen have been the courts, that the way in which, you know, a state Supreme Court or some of the lower courts might uh, interpret some components of an initiative or, you know, other legislative change could matter. You know, again, my instinct is um, most of the courts are, are relatively conservative, aren't going to be so keen on an expansive interpretation uh, of an initiative like this, but would love your take you know, John and Representative Williams to begin with, if there are particular people you're looking at or somebody I didn't name, and then we'll come back to, to Jason and Lynn about what they've seen, you know, kind of from the advocacy perspective about who are the, the type of either insiders or outsiders that can, can really move the needle on some of these questions. So, you know, the governor is in a difficult position because I think the the Republican Party is clearly a the party itself, not necessarily Republicans rank and file, but the party itself is very opposed to uh, this abortion amendment issue one. And, uh, you know, they they tried so hard to defeat it that they put an initiative on the August ballot with the idea that they were going to require a 60 percent approval rating to pass any constitutional amendment. Um, the folks who were opposed to issue one actually moved in excess of five million dollars over to the effort to pass uh, issue one in August. And so that's left them with less money than what they anticipated for, uh, you know, defeating issue one on the November ballot. And so I think the governor and the Republican Party is very focused on issue one, which means they don't really have the bandwidth and the resources to be fighting issue two. And frankly, the rank and file members of the Republican Party are very mixed. You know, about half of them are supportive. Uh, I think I saw a number like 59 percent of gun ho uh, owners are supportive of passing of issue two. So it makes it very messy politically for them. Um, now, once once we get past the November election, uh, Mike DeWine does isn't going to face the voters again. I think it's pretty clear this is the end of his political career. Um, he's going to end as governor. So he doesn't have to really worry about whether or not the voters are upset with him because he's decided that he wants to take a buzzsaw to issue two. That's not the case for the members of the General Assembly. Uh, President Huffman is rumored to be interested in going back to the House and wants to be speaker. Uh, the Republicans in the House currently, the current speaker doesn't have a majority of his own caucus supporting him. Uh, there's, you know, 44 members who voted against him in his own caucus. And so without the Democrats, he's not the speaker of the House. Um, you know, can he thwart uh, Matt Huffman's desire to be the speaker? All of that political stuff is going to be at play here with respect to what happens next. And 
you know, you, you could have a Republican who lives outside of Dayton where 60 percent of his constituents are saying we supported this, where you might go to another part of the state. Uh, you know, you're in Paulding County and 30 percent say they supported it and 70 percent were against it. And so it's not a very clean political issue. You don't have the members of the Republican caucus aligned on the issue. I don't think that the rank and file members are aligned. And so what I anticipate happening is if this passes, it, besides tinkering with the 10 percent where the money is going to and who's getting it, I'd be very surprised if they do anything in the near term. Now, you get past the November 24 election and you're in lame duck in December of 2024. That's typically when members of the General Assembly get up to doing no good things because they know that the voters have already voted for them. So that gives them two years before they have to face them again. If it were me and I had, you know, had to make a bet. I would say that the General Assembly will not move the needle substantially if this passes until potentially December 24. And at that point, you've got basically a year of, you know, implementation, et cetera. You've got, you know, I, to Lynn's point about members not taking money from the tobacco industry. Well, the, the Wholesale Beer and Wine Association is the largest donor in almost every single state in the United States. So it's it's alcohol that is driving a lot of these, you know, coffers for members. It's going to be the same with cannabis. There's going to be a lot of money. Members are going to be taking that money once it passes up through when lame duck happens. And, and I think that that money favors the cannabis industry over anybody else. Um, and so those are things that I anticipate happening. As far as the regulatory scheme, I think the General Assembly generally wants commerce to be dealing with this. They did not like the pharmacy board, um, you know, Kirk Schuring, Senate Bill 9 that hasn't moved, put even more of the eggs in commerce's uh, basket. And then the budget bill, that's exactly what they did. They said, we're moving this to commerce. Um, so uh, my expectation is commerce continues to be the ones that house it. The General Assembly will support that. Um, but again, I, I, I don't think if this passes that the General Assembly is going to do a lot to try to turn this back. Um, I think you will have uh, marijuana regulated like alcohol in Ohio. And I think they'll be tinkering on that as that moves forward. Uh, but like I said, all the while, the industry will be making money and making contributions and you know growing and clout around the General Assembly. And I think they will have a check on the General Assembly doing anything. And, and frankly, the governor is not going to have unilateral ability to do that. He's going to have to get the Senate and the House to go along with him and given the fact that he isn't going to run again, his political clout with the Republicans in the General Assembly is going to be diminished. So uh, my ex expectation is it passes. The General Assembly does a little bit to tinker with it. Uh, but at the end of the day, the industry will be driving a lot of what the regulations look like in the state. Thank you so much, John. And I'll follow up on that briefly, and then I'll, I'll go to Representative Williams and then our other two speakers as well. You know, it seems to be that probably everybody who's attending this webinar and and grateful for all all of you uh, chiming in, we all see cannabis reform as a very big issue and very important, and and you know may be a bigger part of our thinking day to day than probably is true for you know all of the representatives, all of the the people in Ohio, and your comments about the kind of the relationship between issue one and issue two, both in the Republican Party and in kind of the state conversation. Uh, I saw in one of the comments. Uh, somebody mentioning that they haven't seen any ads about issue two, all they see are ads about issue one. And that, I think, is another dimension of my own kind of assessment slash prediction. There's a lot of other things the General Assembly needs to do. And as you've mentioned, um, political functionality is not a hallmark, I guess I'll say, of any legislature that's in charge these days, it seems, as we go weeks without a Speaker of the House at the at the federal level and, and otherwise just sort of notice the challenge of of getting to a vote number to get something done. And so inertia is going to be a very, very powerful force. And that then the lame duck session presents its own unique window uh, for other kinds of legislating. I also would assume, and, and here's Rep. Williams, I'll, I'll loop you in here as well, that when it's time to do the budget bill in 2025, that's always where the inertia in Ohio, uh, Jason and Lynn may or may not know this, that's when the inertia flips around, right? Typically, the, it's hard to get something done because you got to get everybody to vote for it. When it comes to our budget bill that we have to pass every two years, everybody has to vote for that because that has to get done every two years or else we don't we don't have a state budget. And that's often where all of those bills that haven't made it through 
get looped in and, and combined with a, a must vote budget bill. And in fact, um, <clears throat> that's where, as, as John mentioned, we went from uh, a multi-agency control of our medical marijuana program to one that's now relocated uh, just in the Department of Commerce because it just seemed so clumsy and cumbersome the way it was done before. And it was only through the budget bill uh, that that could get done. And so <clears throat> am I wrong, Representative Williams, to think um, it's going to be hard to get anything done because of so much other noise and then maybe lame duck, maybe budget bill 2025 is the sensible time to think about that sort of when change is likely to happen if we think change is necessary. Yeah, I, I think that's pretty accurate. You know, I appreciate John laying down the political climate that we have in Columbus because I'm not going to touch that with a 10 foot pole right now. Um, you know, that's one thing that was new to me. I, I knew of political dysfunction in government, but um, the type of uh, infighting that we have here in the House is something that's new for the state of Ohio. Um, moving forward, I mean, I think there will be some traction towards uh, giving regulatory reform immediately. I mean, if issue two passes, and I anticipate that issue two passes, there will be bills that come out of my office almost immediately. Either I will be introducing them by myself or joining with colleagues that provide, you know, reasonable regulation. I mean, one of my concerns, I'm a Second Amendment advocate, and there's a there, there's a clear statute on the books that says, you know, you are not allowed to own a gun if you are using a drug of abuse or in danger of being addicted to a drug of abuse. And I could easily see that used by certain prosecutors that take firearms out of the hands of individuals that they don't want to see with guns, especially minorities. So that is a major concern of mine with the, the passage of issue two, in, in addition to the homegrown things and, and other issues. So I think there will be some uh, uh, movement, uh, but I, I do believe that the budget bill, you know, next time around, next General Assembly will be a, a avenue uh, for reform uh, on the recreational marijuana uh, point, because uh, it's one way of kind of hiding who the representative is that pushed that issue forward. Although the insiders in Columbus will know, you know, who's pushing a particular amendment to the budget, um, the voters won't know. So, you know, when I introduce a bill now, you know, for time immemorial that I introduced this bill on this date and it went through committee this way. And that was my intention in doing it. But when it comes to the budget cycle, we can hide in policy positions, policy changes um, where individuals don't know who is the driving force behind it. And a lot of times industry will have the ability then to come into the budget cycle, meet with representatives and senators and push amendments forward um, to clarify language in particular industries. And I, and I easily could see um, the recreational marijuana industry and the medical marijuana industry in the state of Ohio coming and looking at reform. I mean, right off the bat, um, medical marijuana patients can't grow inside of their home, but recreational patients would be allowed to, or recreational users would be allowed to. You know, that, that clearly is an issue. Uh, medical marijuana users must keep, um, you know, their 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 uh, their product in the, in, in the original labeling or they face criminal sanctions for that, while now a recreational marijuana user would not have to do so. Um, there's there's clear regulatory issues um, that will be outlined, and some of that I envision. Some of that will be addressed immediately. Some of the things that we we consider uh, really it, uh, immediate issues that need to be fixed before this recreational kind of steam uh, policy starts to steamroll, and you get so much momentum behind it, it's hard to pull it back. Um, so I think there's some issues we won't be able to wait until the next budget cycle. Um, in the next General Assembly to address, and some will need to uh, be done now. I think it will probably be piecemeal. I don't see it being one large piece of legislation. I could see, uh, you know, it getting leaked into other bills. Um, uh, you know, a criminal justice bill that has made it through the House and it's in, in the Senate could get a provision added to it that addresses recreational marijuana, so it comes back to the House and gets a vote. I could easily see that happening. Uh, there's other bills like OVI bills that are pending right now in the House, I could see that we would reevaluate re those bills on the harshness of penalties based off of, you know, the, the level of marijuana in individuals' uh, blood or urine. So I, I definitely think there's momentum um, in the House for change, period, whether this passes or doesn't pass. I've already had conversations with colleagues in regards to it. But I think if it does pass, which I predict that it will, there will be some immediate changes that need to be made before we get into the next election cycle. Thank you very much. Let me go to Jason here because I've got a sort of a follow up that's based on the talk about industry and industry lobbying and resources to move forward things that are favorable to the businesses. Is it your experience and maybe you want to talk to the extent to which the industry and, and business entities are 
supportive of criminal justice reform. My sense is there's there's probably two layers of that. One that they are at the individual level, but my sense is there may be industry players who are eager to, eager to preserve the criminalization of maybe unlicensed sales or you know the range of uh, gray market activities that they fear will undercut their business and would want to have law enforcement and not just you know regulators there uh, to deal with. And so I'm just curious both in terms of your own experience advocating for and, and seeing states move forward with these criminal justice reforms, you know, where, where does the industry tend to fit in? And, and then the broader question of, are there other <clears throat> players or, you know, components of the reform process that your experience highlights that the criminal justice advocates in particular ought to, ought to not lose sight of? Yeah, absolutely. Again, thank you all for the candor of the influence of money in politics. It's always nice to hear folks being very honest about the situation we're working in. And of course, there is in this industry that is using money to influence various parts of the process, right? In my home state of Connecticut, which I was mentioned earlier, we did have to fight for home grow. And that was a big point of contention of whether or not adults should be able to be trusted with growing plants in their home. And there were some companies that felt like we needed to make it so highly regulated and controlled that the regular person shouldn't be trusted with it. And I think that is a mistake. It is still just a plant. Um, but I do think here in Ohio, we have an incredible opportunity where Representative Williams, myself, Mrs. Silver, you know, all agree on some of the immediate things that we can do and move forward on. And we have some time to look at what's been going on everywhere else. Luckily, the last president project did produce a 50 state state of cannabis justice report. And unfortunately, Ohio got a D minus on that report. So happy to go over with the representative all the different ways that we can get that up to an A. Uh, and work together to address some of the influence from the corporate entities that have really been pushing for very little access for the regular person. Now, we brought up some of the issues, for example, of like original packaging and these different parts that we may want to continue to keep criminal. But the reality is that's only going to hurt the interests of patients and folks that are trying to access this plant as a medicine and the regular person that is interacting with the plant of their own accord. Every time we criminalize something, we don't necessarily make it safer or make our community safer. We just fill our prisons with folks that were doing very minor crimes. And so as we move forward in this process, we definitely have to make sure that we're not creating more laws and more opportunities for folks to be arrested in this process and really go through that part first. There's also been a significant amount of discussion over equity programs and the definition of equity, who is able to access these programs, what do they do, how often are they able to issue more licenses, and I think that is going to be a huge point of discussion for all this process, that we really want to make sure when we're creating this industry, that it's local folks that get to run the industry, folks that live in our communities, folks that actually you know go to our schools and go to the same doctors, and I think that is one way to address this massive multi-billion dollar industry coming in and steamrolling the community is to make sure that the licenses go to folks that live in the community. And there's lots of opportunities to do that effectively, making sure folks that are re-entering society are able to access the opportunities that are gonna be able to be addressed. And so I really do think taking our time and making sure proper sequencing is how we are talking about this issue. But when it comes to the big multi-state uh, organizations, the way to really make sure that they don't have total influence on the whole process is to diversify the supply stream, the supply line, so that's made up of lots of small operators and lots of folks that can mobilize their communities to fight back. There is obviously a ton of money in the industry. There's only going to be bigger discussions, especially at the federal level. We start to talk rescheduling and what is that going to look like for Ohio. So we do want to make sure that despite the disarray of speakerships and House legislatures across the country, that we are cognizant that it is moving forward on a federal level. There is no going backwards on this issue. We have to look forward. We have to address the past, but make sure that what we're doing is in line with what the rest of the country is moving. Otherwise, Ohio is going to be in a bit of a time warp and dealing with difficult issues that are unnecessary. So it's going to be a full court press from the community, from a, a folks that are interested, from civil society and the legislature to not allow that influence to happen. And there are some fantastic folks that we can reach out to. Folks at the Parabola Center, like Shaleen Title, who is also one of the alumni of the Ohio State Drug Enforcement Policy Center, knows a lot about what we can do to prevent monopolies and big business from regard to just steamrolling uh, all of our communities. And so I think we're lucky in that there are some amazing people that are fighting this good fight with us that we can bring into this conversation. And with folks like State Representative Williams, Lynn Silver, and myself, if we can all really come together, we can get this right, do it in a way that is sensible and constructive, and make sure we aren't letting big business come in and run something that should be run by the community. Thank you, Jason. And that actually is a good good opportunity for me to segue to Lynn to maybe ask her 
and not just about you know uh, important voices and players in the legislative conversation, especially on public health topics, but um, your own sense of whether I get nonprofit, no profit might be less of a concern to you than small business versus large multi-state operators. But there certainly is a push among some advocates to try to encourage, whether it's states, whether it's the federal government, to um, try to make sure small businesses and local operators are kind of the, the heart and soul of the cannabis industry as opposed to these larger corporate players that are that are multi-state based. Does that sound appealing from a public health perspective? Is it your own sense though, as long as there's a, a profit component, it's it's never gonna work out where there's always gonna be uh, a tension between industry and public health concerns? Um, you know, I think the history is really interesting in California when Proposition 64 was proposed, it had some really strong protections for small businesses and small growers. Um, and that was part of the way it was sold uh, to the voters. Um, as soon as the, the proposition was passed, the California Department of Agriculture caved to big business interests and started issuing what they called stacking licenses. So even though you can only issue a license for a small area, they could issue, they would issue a thousand of them to a single, um, I might be exaggerating that number, but they would issue large um, number of licenses. So it immediately went um, from being small agriculture to big agriculture. Um, so yeah, I think small businesses in general offer less of a hazard than Weed Mart. Um, but there's an immediate pressure on government um, to become friendlier to large businesses, the campaign donations, all the other pressures um, have pushed out small businesses. Equity retailers in California are only 10% of retailers um, and nationally only a small percentage of um, cannabis businesses are run by people of color. So the promise of legalization being a vehicle for bringing economic equity to communities that were hit by the war on drugs has really not been realized. Um, if you're going to legalize and allow for-profit businesses, I would say give 100% of the licenses only to equity retailers, give 50%, but don't just, you know, well, we're gonna give you a few extra points on your application, maybe. <laughs> That's not a viable strategy. And it's really, it's, I see a lot of industry people hiding behind the arguments of equity when in reality they're representing the interests of big producers and major corporations that are investing in this field. Um, so yeah, I like small businesses better, but I don't think it's gonna work for long as an approach just because of economic pressures. So I think the only viable way to really reduce the huge pressure to maximize profits and the effectiveness of American capitalism. I mean, we're good at selling stuff. You know, that's what the U.S. is good about. We're incredibly creative marketers. We are good at driving up consumption. And why it's great to drive up consumption of broccoli, it's not great to drive up consumption of cannabis. It's dangerous. It's bad for health. It's bad for young people. It's bad for productivity. Um, it's not okay that 10% of our young adults are walking around high every day. And we can't, you know, we just can't shut our eyes to that. Um, and if we have this, you know, driven by uh, profit, that's what we're going to get. So Governor Sununo, for example, in New Hampshire is looking closely at, um, at a public monopoly or a private um, or nonprofit. Um, we need a state in the United States to say, no, we can do this differently. We don't have to follow a model that's going to maximize pushing cannabis on our young people in order to legalize it. Let Ohio be that state take leadership, come up with a better model than what we're doing in California. Because what we're doing in California, you know, they say cannabis doesn't kill people and it doesn't kill people like fentanyl does for sure. But it does kill people through car accidents, through psychosis and doing crazy things when you're psychotic um, and through harm to young infants who are exposed in pregnancy. Um, it's not, um, the vast majority of use is not uh, related to evidence-based uh, medical support or uses. It's recreational or it's using cannabis with the illusion that it will help you when in fact, in some situations like depression, suicidality, it makes things worse. Um, so I, I, I'm certain we will come up with an Ohio way, whether it is the best way will remain to be seen. I see John has his hand up. 
Well, so all I was going to say, I mean, one of the one of the challenges with, you know, a non for profit approach or whatever is that you essentially have all these medical marijuana dispensaries who are going to get an adult, they're going to have access to an adult use license. And so um, and I will tell you just from being on the side of folks who were applying for these licenses, it, it was so expensive. It was so incredibly expensive. And, you know, there were a lot of landlords in the state who really took advantage of the fact that they knew this was happening. And so they had stacked, you know, options for leases, which, you know, really kept the small guy from being able to get in the market in the first place. And some of those small guys who got in were like, I got way over my skis on this. I need to sell this out to a multi-state operator now because I don't have this kind of money. And so, you know, as somebody who has watched the small guy and watched the multi-state operator, what the multi-state operator has is resources. And so, you know, I, I think trying to put the toothpaste back in the tube is not going to be possible. So then the question is, you know, for Representative Williams and his colleagues is, OK, well, what do we do to create some sort of equity, you know, program here? Because even if you look at the first application round where there were folks involved who there was an equity application, well, it was really like, well, it's just a straw man. It wasn't actually, you know, a diverse candidate. And so I, I think those are problems for the state to grapple with moving forward, because inevitably, you know, at least my clients are saying, finally, if this passes, we may be able to get our investment money back and be able to make it even because most of them are just bleeding red right now. So, uh, you know, I think your point's a good one. I just think it's going to create some challenges for Ohio as to how we do that. Yeah, I think, John, you're speaking to the reality that whether it's you know, the business and economic development, the public health, the criminal justice issues, how to find that Goldilocks spot is not only challenging on its own right from a perfect policy perspective, but then practically doing it against the backdrop of an existing industry or, you know, being within a country that that has such a diverse set of realities going on. We only have, unfortunately, time for maybe a minute for everybody to do closing statements or wrap up last comments. I saw Jason's hand, then Lynn, and then we'll, we'll finish with you, Rep. Williams. Yeah, I'll just say that there are lots of examples of equity programs that have been constructed already that we can look to and pull from. New Jersey did just give out $10 million in equity grants in order to help some of those small operators get off the ground. And so that is a good example of how it can be done as long as the sequencing of when folks get their licenses, when they get their grants, all these different pieces, because not only is it really expensive, it can take a tremendous amount of time to get your doors open. So you may get your license and not be open for two years later. We saw that in Illinois. And so being able to not give the initial operators such a head start will be huge for those small businesses to be able to operate. Things like not requiring a location before you get started make it a little bit easier as well. But again, this just gives us a lot of time to get this right. We have a lot of agreement on the criminal justice pieces of it. And I think that's where Ohio can really shine and push a lot of those things forward, showing the rest of the country how we did it. So far, zero states have actually let folks out of prison when they legalize cannabis. We want to make sure that all those folks that are currently incarcerated aren't being released into a space that has giant billboards of cannabis while folks are still being locked up. So I really think that together, let's tackle that part first. Let's work together to make sure we have some good opportunities on the criminal justice side of it, and then bring in all of these experts, all the regulators from the other states to really talk about how we can make sure that both big business doesn't take over the market, that young folks have their appropriate safety measures, and that folks are able to grow at their house and learn about the plants. And I think lastly, one thing we didn't really talk about is also reforming our education system and how we teach young people about drug use in society. Now that we're starting to revisit a lot of these questions, how our K through 12 systems are gonna interact with the new law is gonna be very important for their own personal safety, for parents to feel safe. And it's a great place for experts, folks from DEPC, folks like Clint Silver to really talk to the school systems. And so let's not forget that part of the process as we move forward. But again, thank you all so much. Super excited to hear there's so much agreement on criminal justice reform and automatic release. And so looking forward to uh, make sure that happens here right at the beginning of the session. Thank you, Jason. Very quickly, Lynn, go ahead. Um, I would just, um... I've been a public health official for years and I know the costs of running campaigns and education. And I know how outgunned we are by industry um, when we tried to educate people about sugar sweetened beverages, about guns, about any number of, of products. Um, it's very difficult. It's really the commercial environment that drives behavior and how we as a society shape that commercial environment. 
and we can't have any illusions that we have we've never successfully educated our way out of um, drug use, and we've never successfully solved it with prohibition either, as Jason accurately points out. It's a balancing act and a very, very difficult and challenging one. Um, but I would say, even if you're talking about the public monopoly or nonprofit idea, there are ways to make it work. For example, you can grandfather existing medical dispensaries. Um, in Canada, in Quebec, for example, it's not the entire cannabis sector that's under that. It's the retail sector, the part that interfaces with the public and um, most precisely drives uh, consumer behavior. The Some of the production laboratory and other sectors have opportunities for private um, and commercial activities. Um, and so I, I do think there are ways. It's a question of whether there's a will, right, to try something new. So, Representative Williams, you get the last. You get the last word. We wrap it up. Go first, slow and be careful. <laughs> first, I want to say thank you for having this forum, and uh, thank you for all the panelists that participated. It's it's good to see the uh, expertise and insight that was provided here today. You know, I, I take my job as a legislator serious. I, I'm waiting to see what the voice of the people is uh, November seventh. And then we will, you know, move forward accordingly. You know, I, I take that job seriously and I look forward to speaking to all of the panelists in the future as interested stakeholders and interested parties as the state moves forward um, towards regulating the use of recreational marijuana. So I anticipate it passing. I anticipate some regulatory reform coming from our legislative body. And I'm open to discuss with any party in regards to what that, that uh, framework should look like moving forward. Thank you so much. Thank you to everybody who's participated. It's been really a spectacular conversation. Thanks to all those listening in. I take away from it so many things, but especially there's so much work to do and the Drug Enforcement and Policy Center will we'll keep studying and keep doing our best to help elevate the discourse on what really are some just fascinating and challenging issues. And I'm grateful for all of your input to help us have this uh, conversation. Maybe we'll we'll get the whole gang back together in a few a few months and see where we're at. So thank you so much again. Have a great afternoon, everybody. Really appreciate the time and energy, and uh, look forward to talking to you all very soon. Take care. Thank you. It's been an honor. Thanks, all.